Hello, welcome back to the Tracy Developer Meetup. So this is our March edition, and we have special guest Sam Julian on the stream today. Um, so this is a live stream. This is, um, we're streaming on YouTube until things uh, get a little better and we can meet in person again. Um, but for now, uh, please engage with us in the chat throughout the event. So I'll be looking at the chat. I'll be relaying any kind of questions to Sam um, as, as uh, appropriate. If there are any kind of audio or video issues, please also drop those in the chat. Uh, if there's something I can fix, I'd love to be able to fix it right away and not uh, not find out halfway through. Um, so the topic of this evening is going to be around GraphQL and uh, JSON Web Tokens. Uh, but before we get into that, I wanted to uh, make everyone aware of our meetup page. So our meetup page is actually tracydevs.com and I will load it up on the screen here. Uh, so tracydevs.com, um, hold on, let me zoom in. All right, so for future events, um, please check out this site uh, to get an idea of what's coming up next. We meet once a month, usually on a Friday at about 7 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, for example, the next stream, the next meetup is going to be in April and it's gonna be uh, regarding Rust. Uh, but we won't get into that yet because I want the highlight of this evening to be on Sam and GraphQL. Uh, but I just wanted to make everyone aware that we do have an events page. So let's go ahead and switch it back over to me and Sam. And let's see, uh, what are we doing tonight, Sam? Uh, we're going to talk about securing GraphQL backends with JSON web tokens. Awesome, awesome. Um, this is this is an exciting topic. We've had other meetups before on the topic of GraphQL, but we've never we've never had anything on security before. So this is going to be a hot topic. I'll let you take it oh, from here. Awesome. Just let me know when you want me to share your screen. If you want to give any kind of background prior, it's totally up to you. Um, no, I'll just jump right into it. I'll go ahead and uh, hit share. Sweet. Do me. That. I see your screen. Cool. Um, yeah, and I'm going to go ahead and jump on in. Awesome. Cool. cool. Thanks. Well, hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for having me. Happy to be here. I was, uh, at one point, we were making plans for me to come down there and give this talk in person. And uh, then, you know, obviously, we didn't. <laughs> so here we are talking remotely. Um, but, uh, yeah, so this title of this talk is called Becoming a Secret Agent, uh, Securing Your GraphQL Backend with, with JWTs. And it was inspired by this article. This article came out in 2019 that uh, it was on the Hasura blog, and it was all about handling JWTs on the front end in GraphQL clients. And it sparked some discussion and some controversy and uh, got people talking, and it occurred to me that um, I didn't, I hadn't really heard many, heard of many resources on what to do with auth, auth in the back end of GraphQL clients. So I built this talk, and I've been refining it and adding to it and working on it uh, for a while now. And um, so the re reason that I want to build this talk was. First of all, because auth in GraphQL can be really confusing. Auth in general is already confusing, and then you throw GraphQL in there, and it becomes extra confusing. Why is that? Well, when we talk about doing security on the back end of something like a, some sort of REST API, like in Express, we would pretty much just create an endpoint and we throw some sort of middleware on it. Here I've got this little check auth middleware. And then boom, we have a secured endpoint. And that's you know not too bad. But when we talk about GraphQL, we actually just have one endpoint, right? We just have this GraphQL endpoint, and we hit it with a post request with our queries and mutations and things like that. So what do we do? We don't really add a middleware here, right? So uh, how are we going to approach that? So that's what we're going to talk about tonight. So just a little bit about me. I'm Sam Julien. I manage the developer relations team at Auth0. We're a identity as a service platform, basically. We build Auth uh, tools and SDKs and platforms for developers to be used by developers instead of trying to build it all yourself. 
Uh, I've written a book called Getting Started in Developer Relations, and I'm about to publish a book called Guide to Tiny Experiments, which is a simple framework for getting things done. And I also send a weekly newsletter called Developer Micro Skills, which is um, every week I basically send a practical, actionable thing, uh, way to improve in your career as a dev or a dev advocate. So topics like finishing what you start or um, how to ask for feedback, how to say no to things, that kind of thing. It's kind of the meta level stuff that uh, that I do on a daily basis. And you can find all that stuff at samjuling.com. So um, this talk is all in JavaScript, um, but the principles that are in this talk really apply to other languages and frameworks because GraphQL is language agnostic. So I'm going to use examples and libraries and things like that from JavaScript. Um, I particularly use uh, Apollo quite often through this talk, but the big picture stuff should apply whether or not you're a JavaScript developer. So our agenda tonight is first we're going to talk about some auth background. Uh, then we're going to talk about the what and why of JWT so you can understand what that is. And then we're going to go over a bunch of different authorization strategies and patterns in GraphQL. And that'll be the bulk of the talk. So first, let's just talk about some auth background. Auth is confusing because it has a lot of jargon and vocabulary words and things like that. So let's just start with defining the two most important words, uh, authentication and authorization. Sometimes it's uh, easy to get these confused. Authentication is, are you who you say you are? Uh, basically proving your identity. Whereas authorization is, do you have permission to access these resources that you're trying to access? Sorry, my fan just turned on on my computer, so hopefully it's not messing with my audio too much. No, I don't um, hear it at all. Oh, perfect. Beauty of a good condenser mic. <laughs> yep. Um, so let's let's think about how this relates to GraphQL. Authentication, are you who you say you are? Authorization, do you have permission to access these resources? So let's say we have a user, and then we have a GraphQL server. And what's the GraphQL server doing? It's re really the gateway for our database, right? So the GraphQL server doesn't actually really care about if you are who you say you are. It cares about whether you have access to this database because it's kind of like the gatekeeper to whatever data we have. So it needs to know if you have the permission to read and write the data that you're trying to access. What this means is that the GraphQL server uh, doesn't care about proving who you say you are. So authentication, it really cares about who has access to what, which would be uh, authorization. Specifically, there's another vocabulary word called access. And this is what we're talking about here. We want to we, we want to concern ourselves with whether the user has access to this protected resource, and that's authorization. So let's look at an example to make this a little bit more concrete. Let's say you have your back end and your front end on the same server. Uh, so we can say we have maybe a GraphQL server of some kind, maybe Apollo or something else. And then we have Next.js on, on, as our front end, and they're living on the same server. They're being served from the same server. In that scenario, the user could send credentials over to the front end, and then the front end will pass those credentials back to the server, the back end. Uh, and then the server is going to issue a cookie. And the cookie is going to have the session information for the user. And then it's going to send that back to the browser, and everything's going to be good to go. And this is a perfectly valid way to do this when you have your back end and your front end on the same server, because there's just a round trip on the same server. Nothing is traversing across the internet to other servers. But things get a little bit more complicated when we have more than uh, just the same server. So for example, a lot of modern applications, they have a front end, and then they might have an API that's on a different server. And then they might also have other APIs that they're accessing. Maybe you're getting the Airtable API, or maybe you're hitting um, the Sanity CMS Air, uh, API. And so we, we're bringing together all these different pieces into this puzzle. And so what you have there is a different problem than when you have everything on the same server. Similarly, uh, there is another scenario where you have what's called an API gateway, where you've got these, these other APIs, and then you have this one API standing in the middle, 
that is controlling the access to all these other APIs. And GraphQL is a very common way to do this, to, to create an API gateway where you bring together a bunch of APIs at once. So in both of these problems, or the, both of these scenarios of different servers and APIs, you don't just have an access problem anymore. You have something called a delegated access problem because you've got one server, it might be the API or it might be the API gateway that has to control access, gate access to all these other components or servers. And so this is called delegated access. So if we, uh, we have our, our different scenarios here, we've got everything on the same server and then we've got our uh, different APIs, different servers, and then we have the API gateway server. And the, a cookie is really meant for the first scenario where everything's on the first server or the same server. Whereas these other two scenarios, a cookie isn't really designed for this. It's not really designed to keep track of sessions on other servers and uh, control access to other servers. So we need something other than a cookie for this problem. And we have a couple pieces of criteria. We need this, this thing, this artifact that we're gonna create. It needs to be able to contain useful information and it also needs to be able to be signed and verified. We need to prove, since it's going to be um, used to access all these different pieces of a puzzle, we need to know that it came from one trusted source, right? So what is this thing, and how do we safely create it? Well, the name of this thing, or this artifact, is a token. And I'm going to throw another piece of jargon at you called an authorization server. The authorization server is the thing that creates the token, and it helps make access control decisions in your app or your API. So your app says to the authorization server, hey, authorization server, this person over here wants access to this database through this API. Uh, I need some sort of proof that they're able to do this. Here's their credentials. That's what an authorization server does. So that thing that proves that, that uh, grants the person access is called an access token. And it basically tells the API that the bearer has been authorized. So the, the user through the front end gives that access token to the API and says, hey, uh, I have permission to do these things. And the server checks it and says, oh, yeah, you're right. You do have access to that. So let's see that in action. We've got our authorization server here in the top right corner there. And it's got that little access token that gets sent back to the front end where the user is. And then the front end will send that access token back on to the API that's living on a different server. And that's how we can solve that problem of knowing that the front end is the right front end talking to the right back end and everybody has the right permissions. And that same scenario will work in both uh, the situation where you have multiple APIs and also the scenario where you have an API gateway. Because now you can prove that this person is who they say they are and also that they have the permission to access all these different pieces. So that's what an access token is. And you've probably seen one of these before because they have this header. They come to this authorization header. And then you've probably seen this word bearer and then just a string of letters and numbers all kind of jumbled together. And that's probably what you didn't know uh, was a, a token. So that thing, that jumbled mess of letters and numbers is the token. And um, we said we need this artifact, this token, to be able to contain useful information, but also be able to be signed and verified. And it turns out there's a really, really useful format that does this for us. And that's called a JSON web token or a JWT. You might hear them pronounced as JOT. I personally just like to say JWT, but you'll hear them pronounced as JOT all the time. Now, JSON web tokens aren't required by the, by the specification to use for access tokens but they are a very convenient format for it. So you'll see them very commonly used for access tokens. So here's what a JWT looks like. Uh, it looks like a bunch of letters and numbers with a couple of periods thrown in. And at first it just kind of appears to be a jumbled mess, but let's look at what's actually going on there. What's happening here is that we get this piece of JSON and that piece of JSON is run through this encoding mechanism and the encoding, uh, that spits out the string of letters and numbers altogether. So the contents of an access token, which is a JWT in this case, are just going to be JSON, just JSON object like you've seen many times. And th this is going to happen three times because there are actually three different pieces of the token. There's the header, 
which is the algorithm and the toe type. Here you can see an algorithm of HS256 and a type of JWT. And then we have the payload. This is kind of meat of the token. It's all the important bits. And so this is an object that has uh, various claims in it, which are properties of the user and what they can do and all that kind of thing. So the sub claim, for example, is actually uh, basically the user ID. So you'll see that one come up a lot. And there's uh, some of these claims are required and some of them are optional and you don't really need to worry about which ones are which um, to know what to do here. And then lastly, there's a signature at the end. And remember, we needed to be able to do, to do this. So what's going to happen is the authorization server is going to sign this token with a private key, meaning only they know what it is, only that server knows. And then we're going to decode it using a public key from our server, from our API. And, and this is how we're going to be able to prove that this token came from this server, which is what we want to know. So the JWT solves those problems for us. It can contain useful information through claims and can be signed and verified through that public and private key. So I just wanted to show you an example of some, some custom claims that you can add to the token, because you can actually manipulate this token and, and add some things to it. So for example, here we're using Hasura, and in this, uh, in this JWT, we can add a custom set of claims uh, as long as we give it a namespace. And then in here, we can add any sort of roles or um, other properties that we, that we want to communicate between Hasura and the front end or another API or anything like that. So uh, to, to show this again, we've got the access token, and it heads over to our client. And then the client is going to send that over to the server, which in our case is going to be a GraphQL API. And so uh, we've got our user, and we've got our uh, GraphQL server. And we mentioned how, because of this, because the GraphQL server is just concerned with what's going on with the database, uh, the authentication stuff is not really happening in the GraphQL side. Really, all we're concerned about is the authorization side. So your user management stuff, the auth authentication part, is going to live outside of your GraphQL server most of the time. Even if it's on the same physical box or the physical machine, chances are it's going to be in a different layer than your GraphQL stuff. So that kind of begs the question that people ask, which is, should you just build your own authorization server alongside of your GraphQL API? Uh, and that is an interesting educational exercise that you can do. But there are some pitfalls that you're going to want to watch out for that you're going to want to watch out for when you do this. For example, you need to make sure that you're able to implement proper password controls, secure password recovery mechanisms. You're going to know, need to figure out how to transmit those passwords securely. Uh, all kinds of things like brute force attacks, all kinds of stuff that you have to figure out when you go from just sort of a hobby project that you're doing to learn something to actually a customer database that needs to be properly secured. Those are kind of two different things. So, for the hobby stuff, it might be fine to just kind of build your own auth stuff and, and uh, experiment with it. But uh, if you're doing some sort of like paid app or SaaS or something like that, you really want to consider outsourcing this piece of your app. It's just uh, a really good idea to not try to do this yourself because you'll, you'll dig into a hole deep. Now, I'm sure you're thinking like, of course, this dude like works for Auth0. Like, of course, he's going to say that. But it doesn't really need to be Auth0. Even if I wasn't working for Auth0, I would still tell you that you don't really want to build this yourself. There are plenty of good options uh, to save you from having to do this on your own. So we've got our different scenarios here with our different APIs or with our API gateway and our tokens going back and forth, which are JWTs. Now let's actually dive into how to properly do authorization in GraphQL. Now, of course, uh, one thing I always have to mention as a caveat at this part of the talk, like backends and databases are complicated and nuanced. And of course, the way you write something is going to largely depend on what your data looks like and what your use cases are and that kind of thing. So you're you're going to have to take these patterns and, and concepts and kind of adapt them to whatever your use case is. But this will give you a good starting point to, to get started with everything. So the request is going to have the token on it. So the, the front end is going to send over this token as an authorization header. 
and it's going to have this bearer word in front of it. And uh, there are a couple different words that could be there, but most likely it's going to be bearer. And then there's going to be the token. So what we need to do is we need the GraphQL server to grab this token off of the request and verify it using that public key that we mentioned, make sure that it's legit, and then parse it to understand what claims are there, what the user has permission to access. That's, that's the long and short of it. So how do we do that? First, we're going to grab the token from the request, and we're going to add it to our GraphQL context. The context is what we can use. To, it's kind of like state for your GraphQL server, basically, more or less. So when we create our GraphQL server, this is going to be using Apollo, like I mentioned in the beginning, but most of these uh, servers kind of work pretty similarly. But you can define this context function, and uh, you could just read the request and pull the authorization header off the request and then return it as part of the context object that's going to be available in memory anytime you run a request. So uh, that's good. We've got the token, but now we need to actually verify the token and see what's going on with it. So we're going to need to write some code. We're going to need to write a, a function called verify token, and it's going to take the token and it's return back the payload because the payload is going to have the claims that we need to be able to get the user, all that kind of thing. So we're going to first split out from this string because we got to pull this bearer and then the, the, the JWT off. So we're going to uh, grab the token by splitting off the string and grabbing the first element, which is really the second element, um, and grab our bearer token. And remember, um, we've got this third part of the, J of the JWT is the signature. So we need to be sure that some malicious character didn't uh, swap in their own key, their own token that they made. That's basically what we're trying to do here is prevent somebody from pretending to be somebody else and having maybe admin powers in this application. So we, we can do this by um, uh, using the public key. And the public key is available through an endpoint. There's this format called JSON Web Key Set, and your authorization server is going to have this endpoint. Uh, that's going to have the public key on it. So anybody can just reach out to that endpoint and grab the public key and use it to verify a uh, token issued by the server. And those might change periodically, and that's why you have to uh, grab it from the endpoint. So this is just a, uh, a third-party library, JWKS uh, client. And so you just pass in the endpoint and uh, make this little function that's going to grab the public key and um, pass it along to our, uh, our parsing mechanism, basically. So we're going to grab the public key off of this, uh, off this endpoint. And then we're going to use another little library. There's, there's a lot of these uh, for every ecosystem. But there's a, there's a JSON web token node package that, that you can grab. And it'll have this JWT.verify function on it. And you give that function the token and the public key that you just got. This is kind of a fancy way of doing it where you're passing in the actual function to go get the key. Um, so there's sort of some closure and stuff happening there. But basically what you're doing is passing in the token and the public key, along with some identifying information about your um, server and also your API, your auth server and also your API. And you're just telling it, hey, um, here's the token, here's the, the key, and here's some things I expect to match up in this token, uh, like the API and the algorithm and that kind of thing. And so we can wrap this in a try catch and grab this um, uh, payload, which is what's going to come back from that verify function. And that's the payload that's going to have all the claims and all that stuff, that second part of the JWT. And if there's something wrong with it, we can just throw an error that says that the token is invalid. So that's how we verify a token. And by the way, this is exactly the same process that you use in Express. So this part has nothing to do with GraphQL. The only part that has something to do with GraphQL is the context bit. Otherwise, this is exactly what you would do in an Express API or any other backend, uh, more or less. Um, OK, so where do we do this verification? Uh, we could do this, this verification piece inside of all of our GraphQL resolvers if we wanted to. We could put the token on the context and then in the resolver, verify it and grab the claims out and all that stuff. But that would be a lot of duplication. You'd have to do that every single resolver you write. Uh, and that doesn't really make any sense. So 
it makes it more sense to hoist that up into context object and go back to where we were and uh, uh, parse it all there. So we're going to go back to our context object, and instead we're going to we're going to pull this into its own function that we can just pass in when we set up the server. So we're going to create a, a a function here, and first we're going to initialize a couple of variables: one for our token, and one for our custom user. And the reason we're doing this is sometimes you're not going to have a token attached to a quest. If you have any sort of public API at all living along living on this GraphQL server you're not always going to get a, a, a token. You have some read data that is fine for public consumption. So you don't want to expect a, a token on the request and have the whole thing come crashing down. Um, so we initialize, the, uh, initialize those variables, and then we're going to have this try catch where we're going to do what we originally did, where we pull the token off of the header, check, check that it's there. Uh, and if there is a token attached to the header, uh, then we're going to use our verification method and grab that payload. And then what's cool is since we'll have the payload, we'll have the user ID through that sub claim that I mentioned earlier. And so then we can go get the user however we're doing that. We could uh, call our database or, or whatever else you want to do. You, 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 um, this part will kind of swap in with however you're doing it already. So you grab our current user. If we have any problems with either of those things, then we're going to throw an error and just say we're unable to authenticate. Um, and, and so lastly, we can just return the database, the token, and the current user. And then we can use our create context function whenever we're constructing a new Apollo server. We just pass our create context function and pass the request into it. And that's how that'll work. And so then we've got our um, user on the context. And so basically, if we have a user, you can assume that the user is logged in. Otherwise, we would have no user at all. So we can check to see if we have a current user at our method of checking to see if the user is logged in. So if we don't have a user, that means they're not logged in, which means we can throw an error. If we do have a user, we can pull it off the context and then pass that to some other check for things like permissions. So maybe we have a, a another helper function that checks for this create permission and then returns true or false. Um, and then if if they are authenticated and logged in and they do have that authorized uh, permission, then we can um, create the event in the database or create whatever the CRUD operation is. So this is kind of the, the basic way to do this, but there are a number of other ways that we can make this a little bit fancier. <laughs> so uh, we can we can do something called composing resolvers, where we kind of extract out higher order functions, like uh, we could pull out this is authenticated method and uh, uh, use this as like a higher order function where we go to our next part of the resolver. Um, we could do the same thing with um, Oh, well, actually, so then we, when we do that, we create that is authenticated, and we can wrap the rest of the resolver inside of the is authenticated part. Skip that. And then we can do the same thing for the check permissions part. We could just extract that out as a higher order function and check to see that they have that, and then wrap both, uh, wrap the resolver in both is authenticated and check permissions. So that's another way to, to do it. That's the fundamental pattern. But there are other libraries out there that will abstract this away from you and make this a little bit easier to write, which is kind of nice. So one of those is called GraphQL Resolvers. And it provides you uh, with this way that you can just kind of um, uh, either you can, you can write a little helper function. And instead of having to do all that extra logic, you can just check if something's true, and if it's false, there's this little skip helper that basically just moves on to the next uh, thing in the in the order, and otherwise throws an error. So that's really nice because then you can do this little. It provides you this bind resolvers function where you can just kind of stack together these different things that you want to have happen. So that's one option. There's another library called GraphQL Auth, which is um, written by Kurt Kempel from Apollo. And this is just a simple middleware that integrates with any of the servers. Um, and it provides this little with auth helper function that you can use in your resolver. So you can, if you've got your user's query, you can just wrap your resolver in this with auth function, pass in a permission, 
and then the rest of the logic for the resolver. So it's basically the same thing that I showed earlier, but it's just kind of a nice cleaned up way of doing it. Uh, another approach is this library called GraphQL modules. It's a, another very popular library where you can do this resolver composition where you have your different little helper functions that are kind of layered on top of your create event mutation, which is really nice. Another approach you can use for this is through middleware. So I mentioned er middleware at the very beginning uh, for Express, and it does work similarly to this. It's just implemented very differently. So there's a very popular library called GraphQL middleware. This was originally built by Prisma and then sort of was handed off to the community to take to take ownership of. And so in here, you can define this little middleware object and just tell it which functions you want to use for which mutations and queries, and then just add that array of middleware to your constructor for your server. So very nice way of doing this. Somebody, uh, somebody who's really prominent in the Prisma community who is also maintaining um, uh, the GraphQL middleware library, Matik Zavadlal, uh, he wrote this GraphQL Shield library that is actually extremely, extremely popular now. When I first wrote this talk, um, it was sort of neck and neck with everything else. But uh, last I checked, the NPM downloads had either tripled or quadrupled since the first time I gave this talk uh, last year. So GraphQL Shield is really, really popular for doing things like permissions and um, uh, that, that kind of granular authorization. So what you do is you define these sets of rules. They give you all these helper functions, and you can define all these sets of rules, like one for is authenticated, and then you uh, use those rules with some other helper functions to define your permissions. So here, for example, you've got the events page, and it's got the these permissions where you have to be authenticated uh, or uh, you have to be both authenticated or uh, an admin, either an admin or an editor. Sorry, I don't know why that was so hard to say. <laughs> but uh, uh, it uses these little helper functions to make that really, really easy for you. So then you can pass in this array of permissions as a middleware when you construct your server. So those are some approaches for that. The next strategy I want to talk, talk to you about for authorization is using models. So models are sets of functions to read and write data of a certain GraphQL type uh, using additional business logic. Uh, and this might, if you've done any sort of like Rails or things like that, this is going to start dusting some cobwebs off this approach of using models. So let's say we have this dog model, and the dog model has all of our functions on it, like getting them all or getting them by group and that kind of thing. What we can do is we can mix our user information um, in with this. So we would have our we'd make a little factory function that takes the current user and then uh, uses some logic, uses that current user with logic inside these functions. So it could check for different claims and that kind of thing. So for example, we could have our get all function here and that get all function could check to see if we have a user, check to see the roles that the, the user has, um, and then uh, go get our, uh, go fetch our data from the API. Hope you enjoyed that. Um, and so then we can use that model in our create context. And this is just a way to kind of isolate these data functions. Instead of having to do all that in resolvers, we could just make a model that takes in the current user. And so then the last strategy I want to talk to you about is custom directives. And custom directives are extremely powerful. You've actually probably seen them before if you've built any GraphQL APIs because they're actually part of GraphQL spec, which is really cool. So there's a couple that are of, of actual examples that are even part of the spec. One of them is the deprecated um, directive. So here we've got this deprecated one. It tells you that, hey, this field got replaced by this other field. Uh, and then when we are um, defining our types, we can use that deprecated um, directive on our old field and say, so that way when the user tries to query for that and ask for the location field, it gets this message that says like, hey, by the way, this field doesn't exist anymore. Like, go use this other one. And it's a good way to slowly make changes to your API so that whoever's relying on it can make changes and not have to break anything. But there are, there are a number of different reasons to use directives. And you can make your own directives, which is really cool. Um, directives have a lot of advantages. Part of the GraphQL spec, like I mentioned, 
which which is nice because it means it's not going to go away. Like all these other um, libraries that I've been showing you, they're all dependent on people maintaining them and all that. But directives are actually part of the GraphQL spec, so they're not going anywhere. They can also change behavior at runtime. Uh, so for example, one really common use case is internationalization. And because they can uh, do this, they have a lot of use cases. And uh, common ones are like internationalization, uh, translation, uh, and things like authorization, because you're basically being able to just quickly make a change to data on the fly. So we can use custom directives to control access all the way down to the field level. And we can build a custom directive ourselves. The way this works is we have a few different pieces to a custom directive. First, we have the name of the directive. This is called uh, has permission that we're creating right now. And then you define an argument. So we're going to have a, an argument called permission of the type string. And then you tell GraphQL where this field is going to work. So we're going to use this on the field definition. You could also use something like object here. There's a couple of others. So now we have our directive, and it's uh, basically just defined. This is just sort of the GraphQL schema level definition. But we need to actually tell our server what to do when it encounters this directive. So to do that, this is where it gets a little bit gnarly. Um, here's an example using an Apollo. Apollo gives you this class called schema directive visitor. And you basically need to override this class or extend this class and define the has permission directive. And so every server is going to have their own way of doing this. But in Apollo, what you would do is you'd kind of override this or define this visit field definition class or uh, method. And you'll grab the arguments off of the um, directive. So grab that argument. We had one called permission. And then we can pull off the resolver for um, the field. So we're going to have the field. We're going to have the, the arguments, which is going to have the permission that we're passing in. Uh, and then we're going to just define the resolve function for this. So basically, the resolve function is just saying, like, hey, here's what you do when you come across this, this field. Um, so here is where we can actually check to see if the user is logged in. So this will look familiar, because we're just grabbing the user off of our context. And then if we do have a user, that's where we can call our has permission function to say, like, uh, you know, let's pass in uh, Jane Smith and also the create permission. And if if that is all good, then we can move forward with the resolver. Otherwise, we can throw in an error. So I know that's kind of a lot, but really what you're doing here is you're just telling GraphQL, hey, when you see this directive, do this thing with the field. And then we can add this, this custom directive to our uh, schema, just adding in our, our class there that we defined. And then it's ready to be used actually on a mutation or a query or anything like that. So we have our create event mutation uh, of the type event, or that returns the type event. And then it's got this has permission directive with the create permission. So these custom directives are super powerful, but they do have some downsides. One of the downsides is that they couple your logic to your schema. So you can imagine, since you're defining all those uh, all those rules uh, at this directive level, this can get really gnarly really quickly. Uh, it's not necessarily a bad thing to couple logic to your schema, but it is something you want to pay attention to. It might not be a good idea, especially like um, if you have a huge app or uh, an app that gets changed all the time, things like that. That could get really, really gnarly. Um, they also, as, as you could see, they can actually be quite difficult to work on. That was a really simple example, but you can imagine if you've got a number of different things you need to check or multiple calls that need to happen to package together different information or something like that, it, it's going to get like a little difficult to, to keep track of all that. Um, and also, because they're so powerful, they also really need exhaustive testing. It's easy to miss edge cases where things are going, are going on. I, I like to think of these custom directives as like the surgical tools of authorization. They're really powerful, but they can wreak a lot of havoc, uh, havoc if you don't know kind of what you're trying to do here. So we've covered a lot of ground in this uh, talk. So let's do a quick review to help solidify it. We talked about how GraphQL is a layer over your database. Uh, and because of that, it's mostly concerned with authorization.
We also talked about how if you have a front end and a back end on the same server, cookies will work just fine. But when you have multiple APIs in the cloud or some sort of API gateway, the cookie doesn't really work anymore. And we have this delegated access problem. So we talked about how an access token uh, sends the token, an ac authorization server sends the access token to the front end and then passes that along to our back end, our API. And we learned about how JWTs are actually really, really handy to use as a format for this because they can contain useful information, like information about the user, and also be signed and verified. Then we took a tour of authorization practices and patterns. We talked about using our context to go grab the token and verify it. We talked about using our user in our resolvers to um, determine if the user is logged in. And then we covered a number of libraries. So we talked about GraphQL resolvers that has this nice combined resolvers function. We talked about GraphQL auth, where you have this little with auth helper. And we also talked about GraphQL modules, where you have this resolvers composition function. Then we looked at middleware. So GraphQL middleware, for example, where you can define these, this array of middleware and add them to your resolvers. And we talked about GraphQL Shield, which is now super popular, very popular way to authorization and permissions in GraphQL, uh, where you define these rules and then use those rules inside of these permissions that you use to construct your server. We also talked about using models, sets of functions to read and write data. We have our uh, generate dog model factory where we pass in the user and use that to define all of our functions. Uh, and inside of those functions, we can check for the user, check for roles, any, anything like that, and then go uh, fetch from our API. And then the last strategy we talked about was custom directives where we can uh, build our own directive, with a name and an argument on the field, and then use that in our mutation or query to um, uh, check to see if the user is um, has the right permissions, is authorized for the right things. But we also talked about how even though these things are super, super powerful, they couple your logic to your schema, they can be difficult to implement, and they also require exhaust testing. So I know this was a lot. Don't worry, I have all the slides, a ton of references and resources and sample code and libraries and all kinds of stuff. Um, at samj.im slash GraphQL auth, also where you can sign up for my newsletter and anything else. Um, and yeah, that's basically it. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, that's it. So I, as a compliment to you, I, I keep hearing great things about your newsletter. Um, I haven't signed up yet myself, but every everyone seems to be raving about it. So it's hot stuff. Definitely sign up to it. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, I've been really pleased with the response. It's really fun for me because it's the most like it's it's just sort of me writing about what I want to write about. So um, the fact that people are finding it helpful and useful is like really gratifying because I feel like I'm just kind of it's like my form of self-expression. So so um, yeah, I've been I've been really happy. How often um, people does it are finding out? it really helpful? Um, I write it every week. Wow. Um, it's, de it's definitely, I definitely have like really challenged myself to write a, I write about 12 to 1700 words a week Oof, for it. Oh gosh. Um, so a few, a few pages a week for it. And, um, but I've been, I don't know, it's been really good for it. Like it's, it's been a good like exercise for my writing and it, it, I find that writing for a newsletter is easier because you're writing for a specific group of people. Like you, you, you're starting to interact with people. And so I know, you know, uh, uh, who I'm writing to. And so it sharpens my writing a lot to think of it that way. Sure. No, 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 definitely good. Um, uh, the link was up. Um, and this video of course will be on demand as well. So if you miss, if you miss the link, uh, definitely, definitely search for it and, and sign up to that newsletter. Um, yeah, it's just developermicroskills.com. Or if you go to my thanks. Twitter, it's right in my uh, profile, Developer Micro Skills. Awesome. Uh, all right, so we'll let uh, see if any questions trickle in, and I'll go over the, the Tracy Devs website one more time. It's been a, a quiet crowd tonight. I think everyone's a little shy, um, but that's all right. Yeah, no worries. Uh, 
Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to crack open that uh, website once more here. So let me switch over. Uh, I think this is it. Perfect. All right. So um, we just we just heard from Sam on GraphQL, which was fantastic. Uh, next month, the date is April 23rd, and we have a uh, repeat veteran guest, uh, Corbin Crutchley, and he's going to be going over Rust. Um, so he's going to come at it from the, the perspective of being a JavaScript developer, so getting into Rust, uh, which is actually pretty interesting. I actually started with JavaScript, and I went to Go, so this this will hopefully uh, get me get me on the Rust train. I hear, I hear it's uh, a lot more popular <laughs> lately. to learn Rust like three or four years ago. And I just don't think I would had the skill yet to figure yeah. it out, but I definitely have been meaning to like come back around to it now that I've got some more experience under my belt. Yeah, I, I kind of felt the same way. I looked at it, I attended a session once and I was like, what am, what did I just watch? Um, <laughs> but yeah, I think I- Yeah, I, I, I mean, there's be... like, like three different ways to manipulate strings and stuff and <laughs> like three different types of strings and so I, I I tapped out pretty early on, but yeah. But now I, I think I I would go back and enjoy it a lot more. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, in regards to the Tracy Dev stuff, so uh, subscribe to the newsletter. Uh, so the newsletter isn't really a newsletter; it's more of a event reminder. So uh, every every month, about a week before the event actually happens, I send out a reminder email so that way you don't forget. And then I send out one email after the event with the information regarding the on-demand video. So uh, basically two emails per month, no, nothing more than that. Um, so it just keeps you on top of what's happening at Tracy devs. Uh, let me, let me switch over and see if there's any, any comments trickling in, nothing yet. So, um, Sam, is there anything that you want to leave the, uh, listeners with or the, the viewers of this particular meetup? Um, no, not particularly. I hope everybody has an awesome weekend and, uh, would love to meet you in person someday. <laughs> someday it'll happen. One day. Um, <laughs> it, in the uh, in the email that I send out uh, to follow up with this event, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna request um, a response to that email. So I'm gonna ask uh, who would be interested in meeting in person again. Um, and if you wouldn't like to meet in person, please also respond. Uh, so that way I can get a, a tally going of of who's interested in in socializing again and who's ready for it. Um, because uh, we do have a venue, we uh, we can meet in person if if enough people uh, feel like they are comfortable meeting in person. Otherwise, we'll we'll stick with the remote thing for now. Um, until next time, uh, catch you later, everyone. All right, bye bye, everyone. <laughs>